Protostomes are the most abundant animals in the world in terms of species diversity. Many of the groups of protostomes are worm-like and live in marine or freshwater environments. However, the most abundant species are not worm-like. These are the arthropoda, which include insects and crustaceans, like lobsters. And these species are very distinct and complex and can live in a large range of environments. Protostomes are split into two main groups, the Lophotrochozoa and the Ectosozoa. And members within these groups can look really different. But the one difference that they have between them is that the way that they grow. The Lophotrochozoa all grow by extending their skeletons. So worms stretch in order to grow and clams just add layers to their shell and stretch their bodies. In this way, these organisms grow incrementally, not in stages. The Ectosozoa all shed their exoskeletons in order to expand their bodies. This process is known as molting. The best known example of this are insects. Insects are trapped inside a fixed body due to their exoskeleton. In order to grow in size, insects have to leave their exoskeleton behind. They then expand in size and form another exoskeleton. The Lophotrochozoa also have a specialized structure that rings their mouth that allows filter feeding. It is known as the Lophophore. It is a ring structure that pulls water and food particles into the mouth and gut. This is how these organisms feed, via suspension feeding. Protostomes are all triploblastic, bilaterally symmetrical animals. Some are worm-like and others aren't. Those that are worm-like have a well-developed coelom. This provides a space for fluids to circulate in order to provide a hydrostatic skeleton for worm movement. The worm-like body plans can be differentiated into groups by how they eat. The spoonworms, officially known as the Eschurians, are segmented worms. And these worms feed by using a specialized mouth part that extends from the mouth in order to capture food particles. This is known as a proboscis. Food particles are trapped by hairs and mucus in the proboscis, and the cilia move the food particles closer to the mouth in order to be digested. And it's a lot like the Sarlacc from Star Wars. You know the one where Jabba the Hutt captures Luke Skywalker and the gang and makes them walk the plank to the big toothy thing? The pripylids are also known as the penis worms. I did not make that up. That's what they're called. Anyway, these worms eat with a toothed throat that can turn inside out in order to capture food and then it retracts into the stomach. Since we're on movie references, the prilopeds mouth parts a lot like the little mouth of the monster from the movie Alien. You know the one. The Nemertians are also known as the ribbon worms, and their mouth parts have a barbed tip proboscis that extends to ensnare prey and retracts the mouth. Maybe this is more like the alien guy. Arthropods include insects and are protostomes too, but they have a completely different body plan from the worms. The biggest difference is that they have three specific and differently structured body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They also have jointed limbs, Worms don't. And they have a chitinous exoskeleton. And instead of moving hydrostatically, they move with muscles directly. And mollusks are also protostomes, and they have a totally different body plans of worms or insects. And these include snails and slugs. Mollusks move with large muscles at the base of their bodies. On the top of that foot is an internal organ known in a structure known as the visceral mass. And the part that covers the visceral mass is known as the mantle. And in some taxa, the mantle secretes calcium carbonate to produce a shell. You know them as snails. Slugs, however, don't make shells. Protostomes have evolved every kind of feeding mechanism known in animals, from suspension feeding, deposit feeding, liquid feeding, or mass feeding. And they have a very diverse way of getting their food. They can pierce, suck, grind, bite, chew, or even cut. In arthropods, jointed limbs were adapted. This allows those organisms to be able to move efficiently on land. Wings, however, have to be the most important adaptation for all protostomes, and the evidence that supports this is that two-thirds of all multicellular species are winged insects. And all mollusks crawl with a pseudopod, which literally translates to fake foot, and that's the muscly foot on the bottom of a snail. Some aquatic organisms have developed jet propulsion, 
That's when an organism like a squid fills a sac-like structure called a mantle and forces out of a siphon, causing the animal to move in a single direction. Animals have developed several different ways of reproducing, and protostomes do all of them. Some organisms, like the planaria, which is on the photo in the left, just split in two. Others, like a tapeworm, can grow from segments that split from the original organisms. And in some insects, eggs that haven't been fertilized will continue to develop and grow into adults. And this process is known as parthenogenesis. Sexual reproduction is the primary form of reproduction in all animals, including the protostomes. Sessile organisms, that is ones that are always attached to a substrate, fertilize by releasing gametes and allowing them to mix randomly. This is the most common in coral reef communities. Organisms that move around are almost exclusively sexually reproductive with internal fertilization. Okay, buckle your seatbelts. We are going to go on a survey of the major protostome groups from the rotifers all the way down to the insects. And we're going to start with the rotifers. Rotifers are important components of plankton in fresh and brackish water. You've probably never really even seen one before. But they all have a cluster of cilia at one end known as the corona. And in many species, the cilia and the corona beat making suspension feeding possible, forcing food particles into the gut. The next group of organisms are known as the platyhelminthes, also known as the flatworms. The phylum platyhelminthes is very diverse and includes all the flatworms. In general, they have a very broad and flattened body shape with only one opening for ingesting food and eliminating wastes. Of the flatworms, there are three main types. Turbellarians are free-living flatworms that commonly inhabit coral reef ecosystems. They typically hunt protists and other small organisms, but they can also serve as scavengers. Cestodes are parasites that we know as tapeworms. They don't have a mouth, nor do they have a digestive system, but they simply absorb nutrients into their body by diffusion straight from their host. These are nature's ultimate moochers. The last group of flatworms are the trematodes, and they're also parasites, but they bite off and ingest their host tissue so they do have their own digestive tracts, whereas the tapeworms don't. The next group we're going to talk about is the annelida, and they're also known as the segmented worms. It's thought that the oldest group of annelids are the polyacheta. These are segmented worms that have parapodia, and parapodia are the foot-like appendages with many chitae. Chitae are very unique, bristle-like appendages that come out from these organisms. So literally, the polyacheta are organisms with many bristle-like feet. And similarly, the oligochete literally translates to a few bristle-like feet. And this group includes the earthworms. All of these organisms don't have the parapodia, the extensions from the body, but they do have very reduced chete. Bet you didn't realize that earthworms had little hairs on them. The Hyrundia include the leeches, and members of this group have completely lost their parapodia and their chete. Maybe they should have been renamed the achete. Mollusks are the next group, and they have four different groups within the overall group. Bivalves all have two shells attached by a hinge, and they're all suspension feeders. On the picture is a left of a clam. Clams bury themselves into the sand and filter feed with just their mouth parts exposed to the water. Oysters and mussels attach themselves to a substrate and filter feed that way, and scallops are able to move around. Gastropods are marine snails and slugs. And you can always tell them apart because they have a large muscular foot that allows them to move. And they also feed by a radula, which is a mouth on the head of the part of the foot. Can you imagine if you had a mouth on your foot? Kind of weird, huh? The chitons are a weird group. They look a lot like the gastropods in that they have a mus muscular foot and feed by radula. However, they all have eight unique plates that they use for protections, whereas the snail just has a single shell. Cephalopods include the nautilus on the top picture, cuttlefish, squid, and octopus. And they all have very well-developed head, including a beak. In fact, in octopi, the beak is the only hard part in the whole organism. Cephalopod feet have been modified to form tentacles that they can use for grasping. And these are the most intelligent of all the protostomes. 
In fact, I consider this group the great apes of the protozoans. I'll bet you didn't think an octopus was so closely related to a clam, though, did you? Okay, now we're going to leave the Lophotrochozoa and look at the other major group of the protozoans, known as the Ectosozoa. And we're going to first start with nematodes. Nematodes have successfully adapted to nearly every ecosystem, from marine to freshwater to soils and to even the polar regions in the tropics. They're ubiquitous in freshwater, marine water, and terrestrial environments, where they often outnumber other animals in both individuals and species counts. And they're found in locations as diverse as the mountains, deserts, oceanic trenches, and within the Earth's lithosphere. They represent, for example, 90% of all life forms on the ocean floor. Their numerical dominance often exceeding more than 1 million individuals per square meter and account for over 80% of all individual animals on Earth. Their diversity in lifestyles and their presence of various trophic levels point at an important role in many ecosystems. And many are parasitic forms, including pathogens in most, plant, most plants and even animals, inclu including humans. Next on our adventure is a very strange group of animals, the tardigrada, or known as the water bears. The tardigrades are commonly known as water bears, and they're very small, water-dwelling animals. They have a segmented body with eight legs, and their name means slow walker. And the reason that they're called water bears is that the way they walk are reminiscent of the way a bear walks. And tardigrades are known to be able to survive in really extreme environments that would kill almost any other animal. Some can survive in temperatures close to absolute zero. Others can exist in temperatures as high as 151 degrees Celsius, boiling water. Others can exist in areas that are a thousand times more radiation than any other animals could survive in. And even others can survive almost a decade without any water. And since 2007, tardigrades have been returned alive from studies in which they've been exposed to the vacuum of outer space for a few days in low Earth orbit. Pretty crazy if you ask me. The next contestant on the animal family tree are members of the Ectisozoa known as the Onychophora, also known as the velvet worms. The velvet worms are a group of organisms that look a lot like caterpillars. Onychophora literally translates to claw bearers. These obscurely segmented organisms have tiny eyes, antenna, multiple pairs of legs, and even slime glands. They've been variously compared to worms with legs, caterpillars, and even slugs, but they're really totally different. They're most common in tropical regions of the southern hemisphere, and they prey on small animals such as insects, which they catch by squirting an adhesive slime. And in modern zoology, they're particularly renowned for their curious mating behavior, and for bearing live young. The females of many species are fertilized only once during their lives, which leads to copulation sometimes taking place before the reproductive organ of the females are fully developed. The transferred sperms are kept in a special reservoir where they can remain viable for really long periods. But the most successful and diverse group of protostomes are the arthropods. An arthropod is an invertebrate animal having an exoskeleton, an external skeleton, a segmented body, and jointed appendages. As a matter of fact, arthropoda translates from Greek meaning jointed leg, and it includes the insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and others. Arthropods are characterized by their jointed limbs and cuticles, which are mainly made of chitin. The cuticles of crustaceans are also biomineralized with calcium carbonate. The rigid cuticle inhibits growth, so arthropods replace it periodically by molting. The arthropod body plan consists of repeated segments, each with a pair of appendages. It is so versatile that it's been compared to the Swiss Army knives, and it's enabled them to become the most species-rich members of all ecological guilds in nearly every environment on Earth. They have over a million species described, making up more than 80% of all described living animal species. And only one, of, or only one of two main animal groups that are very successful in dry environments, the other ones being the amniotes, which we are. And they range in size from microscopic plankton all the way up to a few meters long. The Myriopoda are a group that includes the millipedes and the centipedes. Millipedes are detritivores, 
meaning that they eat decaying veg vegetation, and millipedes also have two leg pairs per segment. Centipedes, on the other hand, are very effective predators, and they only have a single pair of legs per segment. Insects comes from the Latin word insectum, which means cut into sections. And they're a class of living creatures within the arthropods that have a chitinous exoskeleton, a three-part body including a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, three pairs of jointed legs, compound eyes, and two antennae. And they are the most diverse group of animals on the planet, including more than a million species described, representing more than half of all known living organisms. The number of species that still exist on Earth are estimated between 6 and 10 million and potentially represent 90% of the different life forms on Earth. Insects may be found in nearly all environments, although only a small number of species occur within the oceans themselves, a habitat dominated by another arthropod group, the crustaceans. The Chelicerate body plan consists of two tagmata, the cephalothorax and the abdomen, except that mites have lost the visible distinction between these two sections. The Chilicerae, which give the group its name, are the only appendages that appear before the mouth. In most subgroups, they are modest pinchers used in feeding. However, spiders' Chilicerae form fangs, which in most species are used to inject venom into their prey. Marine Chilicerates have gills, while the air-breathing forms generally have both lungs and trachea. In general, the ganglia of living chelicerate central nervous system fuse into large masses in the cephalothorax. Most chelicerates rely on modified bristles for touch and for information about vibrations, air currents, and chemical changes in their environment. The most active hunting spiders also have very acute eyesight in this group. The crustaceans are predominantly a marine group of arthropods, and they include lobsters, shrimp, and crab. Like the chilerata, they have two tagamata. However, they don't have antenna. They also have a carapace, which is a plate-like exoskeleton that protects the cephalothorax from being demolished.